Uh, we have been, as Paul said, going through the, the prophets, and uh, we've uh, started looking at, uh, at Isaiah last week, uh, that he was speaking to, uh, to the, the country of Judah, to his nation of Judah. Today we're going to look at, uh, at another prophet, uh, Nahum. Nahum is a, is a small three-chapter uh, book, and very little is known about Nahum. Uh, there's a debate about whether he is from a, a place called uh, Elkasi in Galilee or Capernaum. If you remember where Jesus was, uh, was preaching some in Capernaum, and it literally means village of Nahum. Uh, so in, in the beginning it says it's, it's uh, Nahum, the, the Elkishite, and so some people think he's from there, and some people think that traditionally he came from, from Capernaum. But really there's not a whole lot else known about Nahum. Nahum starts preaching about the destruction of Assyria. And uh, Assyria is, uh, is at the height of its power uh, during his time. The, the ten tribes of northern Israel have been swept away uh, by Assyria at this point. And <coughs> Judah is sort of hanging on by a thread. Uh, they have become more like a puppet state to, to Assyria. And, and Judah is starting to wonder, well, why is Assyria prospering and, and we're not? Uh, you know, we're, we're suffering at their hands and what, what is going on? What, why is this going on? And so here comes Nahum. And his message is sort of like a, a sequel to the book of Jonah. If you remember way back several weeks ago, we, we talked about Jonah. And Jonah went to Nineveh and preached to the Assyrians and, and created a, a revival. Reluctantly, he creates a revival amongst the Assyrians. And it says that the whole nation from the king down repented and declared God as their God. Well, 150 years passes, and we get to the time of Nahum, and that generation of Assyrians is long gone, long dead, and that revival, that repentance is, is gone. And they have uh, become the, the, the superpower that uh, they are during Nahum's time. They were a, a scourge during Jonah's time, sort of a, a nuisance to the Israelites, but now they've become a cruel superpower. And this is, this is where Nahum and the Israelites find themselves. It's during the time of, it's like 663 to 612. Is, is the time period that we find Nahum preaching in. It's during the reigns of Manasseh and his son Ammon and Josiah uh, during the, the times of those kings of Judah. Uh, so they're coming out of this, this apostasy of Manasseh who was one of the most evil kings that Judah's ever seen. Uh, he, he sacrificed his own son to the god Moloch. He put the idols inside the temple. He put the high places and the shrines of the, of the other gods up. And so... Uh, a lot of people think that he's, Nahum is beginning his preaching sort of near the end of Manasseh's term, going into Ammon and, and early maybe in Josiah's reign. Ammon, Manasseh's son, reigns for a couple years, and he's assassinated. And then Josiah starts, comes in, and he has lots of reforms during his time. He tries to bring the people back, back to God. And so uh, Nahum is, is during this, this time uh, where all of this is going on in, in Judah. Nahum begins to, is comforting it, uh, the Israelites. He's telling them that God's going to take care of the Assyrians. That God is going to uh, make sure that what's happening to you is basically going to happen to them. Uh, and in 612, Assyria falls to the Babylonians. And so you see uh, Nahum's prophecy and what he's saying come true. So Nahum... Uh, Nahum preaches that the Assyrian Empire is going to fall. Basically today, uh, there's two mounds left of what's left of Nineveh, the Assyrian Empire. Two mounds of dirt in Mosul, Iraq. And they reconstructed the city walls like this, uh, the city walls of Nineveh. Uh, so this has, been, this has been totally reconstructed. It's not what was left. The, uh, the other mound, this is one of the other mounds uh, that's left. And on the top of that mound... Uh, is a mosque, the mosque of uh, Nabi Yunus, which is to the prophet Jonah. So even the, the, the Muslims uh, revere the prophet Jonah. They know the great man of God came and, and preached to them about God. So this is really what's left of the Assyrian Empire and of Nineveh. You, there's no ruins to speak of. It's those two mounds uh, that they've, they've, they've put some things on top of. The Assyrian Empire's gone. And, and Nahum preaches this to, to the, to the uh, Israelites. And it's nicely organized, the, the book of Nahum. And so, uh, I don't do this a whole lot, but it's, it's outlined, and I couldn't resist to, to do it. So if you don't have a bulletin, you can kind of follow along with it if, if you need one. Uh, it has, uh, has little points you can write. You can write as we go along, uh, write little notes in there. Nahum is, is, is organized into three chapters. And in the first chapter, he, uh, he says, A serious destruction is declared. He declares that Assyria is going down. He says, this is what the Lord says. 
Though the Assyrians have many allies, they will be destroyed and disappear. My people, I have punished you before, but I will not punish you again. Now I will break the yoke of bondage from your neck and tear off the chains of Assyrian oppression. The God, in the beginning, through Nahum, says, I've got this. I've got your back. Your cities have been swept away. Your capital has been sieged. Assyria has been plaguing Judah. They've been taking over cities one after the other. They've sieged the capital city, and then God miraculously saved him. They have really been causing a lot of problems. And he says, look, how they treat people and how they're conquering you. And Judah's thinking, how are we going to stand up to this? How are we, little bitty Judah, all by ourselves, going to stand up to these mighty Assyrians? And Nahum says, don't worry. God's got it. Because the Assyrians, as we do, we forget about how God has rescued us and what God has done for us in the past. They forget about the Red Sea. They forget about Joshua and Jericho. They forget about David and Goliath. They forget how God has rescued them time and again. And so here he is saying, don't worry, the Assyrians are going to be taken care of. He declares that they will be destroyed. Nahum, it really is a book about comfort. He's comforting the, the, them during a time where they don't see a way out of this, this oppression that Assyria is providing. He says later in that same chapter, Look, a messenger is coming over the mountains with good news. He is bringing a message of peace. Celebrate your festivals, O people of Judah. Fulfill all your vows. Your wicked enemies will never invade your land again. They will be completely destroyed. Can you see the, the comfort in those words to a, to a people whose world is, is being torn upside down? You know, they saw a lot of their, uh, their, their, their family members probably and other tribes get swept away by this country, by, by Assyria. And, and now during this time where they're, they're coming out of this, this bad time of, of Manasseh and, and they have uh, so the, a, a king maybe trying to try bring them back to God. They're, they're wondering, what, what is going on around us? And then he starts talking about uh, this, this messenger with good news. And whether this is talking about the Persian king, uh, Cyrus who's going to come and he's going he's to bring them some temporary relief when he allows them to rebuild the temple later on and, and after they're brought into exile, he'll allow them to come back. Or whether he's looking even further ahead to a, to a more eternal peace with Jesus. His message is that Assyria is going to be destroyed. You guys don't have to worry about this. Take comfort in the fact that eventually God will take care of it. And then in, in chapter 2, the Assyrian destru destru destruction is described. It's described, and, it, and he's very detailed about it. The shields of the soldiers attacking Nineveh are red. The armies are dressed in bright red uniforms. The metal on their chariots flashes when they are prepared for war. Their spears are ready to use. The chariots race through the main streets. They rush back and forth through them. They look like flaming torches. They dart around like lightning. So are the, are the soldiers' shields stained with blood because they're, they're marching cruelly through, through the city? Are they, are they wearing the, the, their red uniforms and, and clothed in, in red uniforms? In Ezekiel 23, 14, it, it tells us that the Babylonian military officers were dressed in red. And, and history also bears out that description, that Babylon wore red. And so it's like he's, he's describing this Babylonian destruction of Assyria. The Babylonians will come along in, in 612 and take over the Assyrians and conquer Nineveh and totally destroy their city. So it seems like he's having a, a description, a very vivid description of what's going to happen to the Assyrians. And then look at the next part of the description. The king shouts to his officers. They stumble in haste, rushing to the walls to set up their defenses. The river gates have been torn open. The palace is about to collapse. Nineveh is like a leaking water reservoir. The people are slipping away. What's all this business with river gates torn open and, 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 and the palace collapsing and the leaking water reservoir? Well, you find out that when Nineveh was conquered by the Babylonians, what they did was they, they, cut up, they shut up their river gates that the Assyrians had had to control the water flow of the two rivers going through their capital city, Nineveh. So the Babylonians shut off the flow of the river gates, effectively cutting off their drinking water supply. And then they let the water reservoirs fill up and fill up and fill up. And then they opened them and the water came crashing into the city, flooding the city and weakening and breaking down the walls. So that they could easier come through and smash through. And so in, in this description of Nahum describing what's going to happen to, to Assyria in a more poetic form, he's describing historically what happens to the city of, of Nineveh and, in, and their destruction. And so he describes it. And then in, the, in chapter 3, he says Assyria's destruction is deserved. And, and it, this is a much more poetic form. Nahum really is, 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 is more, more poetry than anything else. And you listen to the, to the way that it's... Uh, the, the cadence that he, that he does this with. 
Woe to the city of blood, full of lies, full of plunder, never without victims, the crack of whips, the clatter of wheels, galloping horses, jolting chariots, charging cavalry, flashing swords, glittering spears, many casualties, piles of dead, bodies without number, people stumbling over the corpses, all because of the wanton lust of a prostitute, alluring the mistress of sorceries who enslaved nations by her prostitution and peoples by her witchcraft. Now it's tempting we read these verses and we say, well, that's a, that sounds like a description of the destruction that we talked about in chapter 2. Right? He's describing more of the, the destruction. But when you read it as the, as the poetry that, that it really is, that it's more like he's, he's describing the punctuated march of a military machine. You hear kind of the cadence in the poetry, the way there's a charging cavalry, flashing swords, and you get kind of in a rhythm. It's like soldiers marching, marching through the streets. And that's exactly the way the Assyrian war machine worked. That, that, that when they came through, they marched through cities cruelly, and they, they're described as, uh, as smashing babies on the streets and just, just marching through utterly with, without mercy. And so it, it, here he's starting to say, look, these, these guys are, are marching through. And why? Because of their, their lust. Because of their lust for power and their lust for greed and their, their desire to enslave other nations. And now... Assyria is going to be conquered the same way that she conquered all of these other people. And, and, and it describes later on a, a city of, of thieves. And, and, and there's a king called uh, Assurbanipal. I don't even know if I'm saying that right. But there's a king of Assyria named Assurbanipal. And it, it describes how he boasts that he tore the limbs, and the limbs off of kings. And, and he boasts about how he, he dines in a garden under the, the head of a king that he had chopped off and he's eating underneath the head and it, and it describes how he forces a prince to wear the head of his king around his neck. This is the cruelty of the Assyrians that, that, that they're having. So you, you see how the Assyrians are going to be conquered and the same thing as they've been doing to other people is going to happen to them because they deserve it because they've, they've, they've been so wicked and so cruel to so many, to so many people. And later on in this chapter he compares them to Thebes, which is a city in Egypt. It's one of the, one of the capitals of, of uh, Egyptian territory. And the Assyrians conquered Thebes. They came in, they marched through, they knocked down its walls, they knocked down its fences. Uh, late, there's a verse in there talking about smashing babies on rocks. This is what they did in Thebes. They marched in, had no mercy on the women and children. Thebes was set up. Pretty strategically. It had water on all sides. It had some allies. You can see that in the verses as well. Egypt, Put, Libya. That they had allies. They had strategic defensive position. But Assyria marched through and totally annihilated them. And now, that's going to happen to Assyria. That they deserve what's coming. God's telling them, don't worry. Assyria is going to get what they deserve. And so this is comforting to these people. To these Israelites. That, that, are, that are under their oppression. They, don't worry, I've got this. But it's more than just a description of Assyria's destruction. It's more than just about Assyria because he gives us a description of God and of God's character through this. You look back in, in chapter 1 and his declaration of Assyria's destruction also includes a few statements about God. He says, the Lord is jealous. The Lord is a jealous God filled with vengeance and rage. He takes revenge on all those who oppose Him and continues to rage against His enemies. But what does it mean for God to be jealous? What does it mean for God to be jealous? You see, we, we view jealousy as wrong. right? It's, it's, it's sinful. We, think of, we tend to think of jealousy, you know, a, a jealous husband. When a uh, wife's talking to somebody else, even though she's given him no indication maybe that, that she's being unfaithful, but he's, he's jealous. He's jealous of her. Or we think of the neighbor or the friend who is jealous when we get something good, when something good happens to us, and they, they're, 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 they're mad about it, and then when something bad happens to us, you know, they're smirking and they're smiling, ah, oh, they got what they deserve. That's what we kind of think of when we think of jealous. It's, it's envy coming out of a self-serving hatred, and, and that definitely is an aspect to, to jealousy. Paul tells the Corinthians that love does not envy. John tells us that God is love. So how can God be jealous? How can a God be jealous? The same word here in Hebrew that's used for jealous also means a couple other things. It means zealous or passionate or avenging. And, and this is the aspect, the character of God, the concept of God's jealous character. That God will not allow without punishment and He will not allow His people to be hurt without some vindication. 
God is like a parent. And he's described other places like a parent. In 1 John, he says, see how very much our Father loves us. In Isaiah, he says, I comfort you in Jerusalem as a mother comforts her child. Described with these parenting things. This is for us to understand the, the nature and the character of God. So how does this parenting relate to, to God, to relate to jealousy? Let me put it in perspective for you. I want you to imagine for a minute that you come home from work, come home from wherever, and on your couch, your 13-year-old daughter is sitting, and there's a man with her, and he looks to be about in his 40s, and the man says, your daughter and I have been chatting online, and we're in love, and we've agreed that we're going to elope, to a country that will allow her to marry me, and I've come to pick her up. Okay. Now, before you do one of two things, you're going, to, you're going to either throw him out and call the police, or some of you may go get the gun and end up find yourself sitting in a prison at some point. Okay? After those things take place and you have some time to figure out all the motions that are swirling around from the events, you might come to the conclusion that what you're feeling is jealousy. You're jealous for the affection that rightly still belongs to you. And you're jealous for the safety and the protection that rightfully belongs to her. This is God. That God is jealous for our affection that rightfully belongs to Him. And for our safety and protection and happiness that rightfully belongs to us. Zealous. Jealous for that. This is how God is jealous for us. But Nahum also says that the Lord is powerful, that He's patient and He's powerful. He says the Lord is slow to get angry, but His power is great. And he never lets the guilty go unpunished. He displays His power in the whirlwind and the storm. The billowing clouds are the dust beneath His feet. His presence, the mountains quake, the hills melt away. We've got to be grateful for the Lord's patience. And for the Lord's power. Without the patience, the power doesn't, doesn't work. So these two things work together. The patience gives everybody time to, to come to Him. Peter tells us that He wants all to come to repentance. And, and, and we get this, this concept of God always being incredibly patient. And without that, His power would, like it says, melt the hills away. Nahum shows that His power makes these mountains and these hills quake uh, quake away. I've shown this picture before. Uh, this is a picture of uh, Petra, and uh, it was a, a capital city of, of Edom that we saw way, way back in Obadiah, and, and how they were they were conquered. This is a picture of Masada, which we talked about uh, on, on Sunday night a little bit, uh, a Jewish fort that uh, fell during the Roman times. These are nothing more now than historical ruins that people can go and explore. They're tourist attractions. I can't show you ruins like this of Assyria because God's power wiped them away. I showed you the mounds, but these are a little bit more. They're standing, but even these rocks, these mountain fortresses cannot stand behind the power of God. And, and we, we see pictures of this, and Nahum says God is powerful, but He's patient. He's patient and He's powerful. And then finally, Nahum says the Lord is good. The Lord is good. A strong refuge when trouble comes, he's close to those who trust in him. This is the most frequent declaration about God's character. God supplies everything we need, supplies every blessing we need, supplies abundant grace to us. But during the suffering times, and we talked a little bit about this on, on Wednesday, that through the times of trial and suffering, people go, is God good? Is he, is he good? It's hard to see his goodness in suffering. And, and you remember... The Israelites are suffering oppression from the Assyrians. They may be coming out of an evil time of Manasseh. And they're going, is God really good? And Nahum says, the Lord is good. A strong refuge for those who are close to Him and trust in Him. And this is a struggle throughout the Bible. God's justice versus God's goodness. Job struggles with it. David struggles with it. Moses struggles with it. We'll see next week that Habakkuk struggles with it. God's goodness is something that is a, is a tough struggle. But... He assures us God is good. He's good. And Paul tells us later that God will cause all good for those who love Him. He's good. And Nahum ends his message with sort of an epitaph for the Assyrian kings. 
He says, you shepherds are asleep, O Assyrian king. Your princes lie dead in the dust. Imagine this on your tombstone. Your people are scattered across the mountains with no one to gather them. There is no healing for your wound. Your injury is fatal. All who hear of your destruction will clap their hands for joy. Where can anyone be found who has not suffered from your continual cruelty? That's an epitaph on a tombstone for Assyria. And shepherd is a common uh, Old Testament and a common Near Eastern term for ruler. He's saying your rulers, your rulers are gone. Your rulers are done. The kingdoms of the world will be brought down. The evil kingdoms of the world will be brought down. But the thing is, is we have a good shepherd. Like those Assyrian shepherds, just as evil as they were, we have a good shepherd, John tells us. We have a good shepherd that knows his flock, knows what we need, knows where we are in relation to him, and calls out to us, wants us to recognize his voice, and wants us to cultivate an intimacy with him. And he tells us that there will be a bright future for all of those who trust in that good shepherd. And that's where we find ourselves, asking ourselves, do we trust our good shepherd? Do we want to cultivate a relationship with him? Do we want to follow him as, as the flock that he, that he knows us? He knows us each by name. Do we want to follow him? Let's pray. Lord God in heaven, I thank you for your message through Nahum. I thank you for the, the comfort that you give us knowing that no matter where we find ourselves, if we find ourselves walking through fire if we find ourselves being persecuted, uh, if we find ourselves, Lord, uh, being tortured because of whatever uh, we believe, uh, that you will take care of things. That, Lord, ultimately everyone will bow down and kneel before you, that you will take care of things. Uh, we know, Lord, that, that you are good, that you, you want us to come to you, that you are jealous for our affection, that you are jealous for all of us, to, to give you our, our heart and our mind and our soul. And, and I pray, Lord, that you change us from the inside out, that you transform us spiritually uh, into something that we can't even imagine ourselves. I pray that, our, that the Holy Spirit will hover in our lives and that uh, you will show us uh, where we need to be and, and, and uh, how we can grow in love with you and show love to others. In Jesus' name, amen.